It's hideous. Oh, that's not very nice. Marvel Spider-Man 2 was a game that frankly had a lot to live up to. 2018 Spider-Man on the PS4 was a massive surprise. Insomniac Games came along and delivered the ultimate Spidey experience. One of the best Spider-Man stories we have seen across various spans of media from films to comic books to other Spider-Man games, Insomniac truly delivered something special. Nailing key themes such as Spider-Man and Peter Parker's lives being in direct conflict and the idea of when Spider-Man wins, Peter Parker loses. But not only did it deliver a great story, but it also revolutionized web swinging mechanics to a point where exploring a semi-realistic and sprawling open world set in New York City was a joy instead of a chore, which is a hurdle that many open world games today struggle with. Throw in a slice of fun combat, a handful of iconic Spider-Man villains, and they truly had something special on their hands. So yeah, it's safe to say that Insomniac had their work cut out for them with the long-awaited sequel, Spider-Man 2. And you know, I'm something of a Spider-Man fan myself, so I was eager to see what they were going to cook up with the sequel. So today, we're going to be diving deep into Spider-Man 2 now that the hype has settled down with this after-the-hype look at the game. Was this a sequel that topped the original, or was it a sequel that bit off a little more than it could chew and maybe got a little too ambitious for its own good? Well, let's find out. So, let's talk gameplay. The gameplay in these Spider-Man games, it's been great since the first game back in 2018. The Miles Morales game continued that and this game gave it a relatively large overhaul. These Spider-Man games do a lot for me in the sense that I find the general gameplay loop fun, which as I get older, I'm starting to find that to be the case less and less, which could be indicative of some game franchises getting a little stale, like Far Cry or even Assassin's Creed to be honest. But that problem is nowhere to be seen in Spider-Man 2. The amount of times I told myself one more this, one more that, and then proceeded to turn into a gremlin and play for another seven hours was honestly a little bit ridiculous. I think Insomniac built very well off the foundations of the first game to help create something that you can just keep playing. It also helps that swinging around New York has never felt better. The web swinging mechanics are very similar to the first game, but minor and major changes were made for the betterment of traversing New York. One of the most controversial changes were the web wings, allowing you to glide around New York, Brooklyn, and Queens. Now, I do understand why some people took issue with this new mechanic, as web swinging mechanics are just so much fun already, like why add something that would lead to you swinging around the map less and less? But I think Insomniac were in a position where they would have received backlash if they hadn't added an innovation like this. Because many aspects of the gameplay are identical to the first game, but when it comes down to it, if you don't like the web wings and just want to swing around the city more, just don't use the web wings. The game did have some sections where you're forced to use them, but you can put them away and swing until your heart's content. It's just going to take you a little longer to get from A to B as the map is much bigger this time round. But one of the major hooks of these Insomniac Spider-Man games is the combat. Very much following that Arkham style combat system. They chose to keep the general combat similar to the first two games, which is a good thing and maybe a bad thing. There were times where I found myself constantly spamming one button when surrounded by enemies because I just found myself getting a little lazy toward the end of the game. You may very well have done this too, just smashing buttons like square like there's no tomorrow. Like yeah, you can press circle to dodge and you can parry, but by the end of the game, I just found myself spamming gadgets to get certain engagements over a little bit quicker. This was mostly when fighting symbiotes toward the end of the game because they were really annoying to fight, but I think this is the problem when you don't really innovate your basic combat all that much across what has now been three games. It can feel very samey, and the further I got into the game, although I was still having fun, I wasn't as eager to rush to a crime in progress as I was at the beginning of my time with the game. And I mean, the symbiote suits in the second half of the game certainly helped freshen things up in a big way and kept things quite enjoyable, which definitely helped counter the staleness I was feeling with the basic combat by the game's end. But one of the aspects of the game's combat that never got stale for me was the boss battles. Look, the boss battles in the first game, they were pretty good. Some better than others, but a strong pass mark. This time around, the boss battles were absolutely fantastic. And there are so many of them, whether it's Lizard, Martin Lee, Peter, Craven, Venom, Scream, all the boss battles were enjoyable. But I must say, thank God they added a health bar this time around. Like, thank you. Now, of course, I can't get through a gameplay section without talking about the fact you get to play as Venom. 
This caught me completely off guard and I wish you could have seen the cheesy grin on my face when the camera panned behind Venom. And then you just get to wreck shop. I think we were all living out a dream come true in this sequence, let's be honest. So the gameplay in Spider-Man 2 as a whole is a standout as expected. Although I wouldn't call it perfect as like I said, sometimes I felt like it got a little stale in small areas as I got to the end of my playtime. But man, swinging around New York never gets old. They continue to nail what it feels like to be Spider-Man swinging around the city, diving off buildings. They just get it. But now let's talk story. This is, in my opinion, the most interesting part about this game because this is where some people will say this game is a masterpiece and some people will say it's not as good as the first game. The initial hype when the game came out had people making big claims about this game's story and by and large the game itself, but that's the perk of an after the hype video. We get to look at things with a bit more of a level head. So Spider-Man 2 deals with Peter and Miles struggling to figure out the next steps of their lives whilst still balancing being Spider-Man. And a bunch of new threats arise throughout the game that bleed into the struggles they're facing. Kraven comes to New York, essentially turning New York into a massive hunting ground. Harry is back from his hiatus in the first game, but he's healed and under strange circumstances. The first act of the story is relatively strong. It reunites us with familiar characters, updates us on where they are in their life and the struggles they're facing with their next steps. It also brings Harry back and fills us in on all of the backstory we didn't get because the first game takes place after Harry already disappeared for his treatment. The game really lets the characters come to the forefront here, giving us flashbacks to Peter and Harry in high school, helping to familiarize players with their bonds so the conflict they face later in the game hits harder. And the second act is where the game really picks up and also starts to get a little bit messy. And I think messy is one of the best ways to summarize the story in Spider-Man 2. I feel like the story maybe took a little bit too much on for its own good. You've got Peter dealing with the trauma of losing May and figuring out what's next. You've got Miles dealing with his life after high school and his desire for vengeance on Martin Lee. You've got MJ dealing with her own issues, Craven and his final hunt, Harry and the symbiote. There's just a lot going on. And as a result, I feel like some plot threads, not all of them, some of them don't get the time they needed. Which is frustrating seeing as one of the game's biggest complaints is that it's too short. So to see them take on so much story-wise and have some things wrap up a little quick is a small frustration I do have with the game. Having said that, most of what is here, when it gets the time it deserves, works. And it works so damn well. One of the best aspects of the game's story ties into Peter's slow deterioration with the symbiote. Yuri Lowenthal's performance shines here and the game did a great job in getting across how the symbiote is affecting Peter and how his deterioration mirrors the issues that he's facing in his life. Because of it, we get some great moments such as Peter's conflicts with Harry and Miles as well as Peter hunting down MJ in an actually really effective horror sequence. And let's just, let's just talk about Miles having to fight Peter and save him from the symbiote. I love this boss fight, I love this moment in the story, I love what it means for the characters and how it carries through to the end of the game with Miles being the one to take the temporary Spider-Man mantle. It's just great. As for Kraven, Kraven is a standout, surprisingly. A villain that essentially wants to die. It's interesting and it makes for some great encounters between Kraven and our two Spider-Men. He's a massive threat and the game conveys this by having him kill the Sinister Six basically off screen. Mostly anyway, which I feel like was a consequence of them taking too much on and not having the time necessarily to show it. But regardless, the point got across and he was definitely a worthy villain to cause conflict until Venom showed up. I will say though, it did feel a bit weird for Kraven to be the central villain of the game for so long and have him die when Peter and Miles aren't even around. Like Peter finds out Kraven died over a phone call, which just felt kind of off. But it must be said that Miles is a standout in this story. The internal struggle with dealing with Martin Lee was really interesting. This man ripped Miles' life apart by being responsible for killing his father, and Miles gets to confront the pain he's endured over the past couple games. There's a moment where Miles stops helping people because his own selfish desires of revenge and wanting to put Lee away takes over, and a lot of the game is Miles overcoming that. He goes through that journey of dealing with his desire of revenge. He sort of finds out who he really is in that process. 
And in that process, he also proves himself to be worthy of carrying that Spider-Man mantle which bleeds into the end of the game. But let's talk about Venom, because this was a major selling point of the game, and when they said that Venom wasn't going to be Eddie Brock, I think it was kind of obvious that it was going to be Harry, and that's where it all leads. Venom in this game is fantastic, to be honest. The look, the voice, just everything came together so well for Venom to live up to the hype. The fact that it was Harry as well makes for a pretty gut-wrenching final act, the groundwork that was laid early in the game with Peter and Harry's friendship made this such an effective final showdown. But if I was to nitpick the game's ending though, and I'm going to because I just have to, keeping Harry alive I thought kind of weakened the ending just a little bit. Like don't get me wrong, I know he's in a coma and everything so he's technically alive but he's kind of not. But again, a major theme of Spider-Man stories is when Spider-Man wins, Peter Parker loses. So Spider-Man having to kill Harry to get rid of the symbiote would bleed into that theme perfectly. And it looks like that's exactly what they're doing. But then the trope of bringing someone back to life who's dead is triggered and it just kind of felt a little cheap. I wish they went with the ballsy move of just killing Harry to keep that theme a little more consistent. Like they were setting up Norman's Green Goblin arc anyway and I feel like the death of Harry would have added even more punch to that. Also, whilst I do like the idea of the way the game ends in the sense that Peter gets the freedom to go and be Peter and figure out his life now that Miles is ready to take over, you know, I like it, but almost feel like this is an ending that would have actually worked better if they were to do this in the third game. Because many aspects of Spider-Man 2 are setting up a third installment, you know, seeds planted for another game, which I feel it kind of contradicts the ending. Because given the setup here, we know Peter's hiatus isn't going to last long, so it kind of dampens the ending a little bit. Like, we know Norman is about to Green Goblin shit up and Doc Ock is about to get out, so Peter's going to be dragged right back into the fray again anyway. This is what I mean when I say the story is a little bit messy. Some plot threads don't necessarily get the payoff they deserve. The ending kind of contradicts itself a little bit, but man, what does work here just works so damn well. But I will mention the flame side story was a little underwhelming until the end. It kind of just felt like you were doing things because this cult were being bad and Wraith would show up and be angry at you and rinse and repeat. It was by no means bad and I still kind of enjoyed doing it but it definitely was one of the weakest elements of the game. The end had some payoff when we get the Cletus Cassidy reveal which we will no doubt see in a future DLC or a third game. But overall, in terms of story, I think the first game all round is a much tidier and watertight story. But I feel like Spider-Man 2 has higher highs, but lower lows. It's a triumph, don't get me wrong, but it's a flawed one. So one of the major selling points of this game, for me at least, was the exploration. Being able to traverse New York as Spider-Man is a great selling point in of itself, but this time around they really managed to make New York feel even more alive than the first game. Thanks to the power of the PS5, it's obvious Insomniac could go a little further with pushing the limits here. Adding Brooklyn and Queens, having almost instant swapping between Peter and Miles, and of course the scale of the set pieces. But this game is simply just a damn near perfect game when it comes to exploration specifically. At no point was I ever bored traversing this city, slingshotting myself across the map, gliding over vents, pulling off insane movement combinations, or diving off of the tallest building. Even though I have 100% completed the game, I still find myself jumping back into it just to swing around and look at the city in all its glory. Now many open world games nowadays suffer from something people like to call Ubisoftification. Essentially, filler tasks spread around the map to encourage exploration. Now if you have played any modern Assassin's Creed or Far Cry title, then you are very familiar with what this is. The problem is, this has spread to so many games beyond just Ubisoft titles. Spider-Man 2 definitely has easy content spread around the map to encourage you to explore, don't get me wrong, but I'd argue that basically all of it is actually worth exploring. Especially if you are a big Spider-Man fan. Whether it's Flint Marco's memories, Prowler stashes, even the Spider-Bots had some really cool references worth finding, and the photo ops as well. Some of those were really funny. There was at least some value there, and in order to traverse the map to find these POIs, you play to the game's greatest strength, that being its web swinging and traversal options. 
there are times playing open world games where I'll see somewhere that I need to go and think, yeah, nah, I'm good. But I never got that feeling in Spider-Man 2. It was like, oh, that's on the other side of the map? Great, let's go do it. I think I fast traveled maybe once in my entire playthrough. Whereas with AC Mirage just recently, I was fast traveling every five seconds because I just didn't want to traverse the map, even though the map was really small. Now, look, I'm not going to act like Spider-Man 2 is the peak of explorable content in the gaming industry because, I mean, it's, it's just not. But it's enough. It's enough in the sense that it doesn't feel like a chore. Don't get me wrong, at times there were some side tasks that were a little bit tedious, but I was absolutely still going to do them. Of course I was. A major factor in encouraging exploration in this game comes in the form of finding tech parts so you can craft suits. The suits are one of the best parts of the game, and the sheer amount of them between Peter and Miles is just ridiculous, to be honest. Then throw in the option to change colors of certain suits, and it's absolutely worth exploring to get tech parts necessary to craft new suits. But it's not just the suits though. Exploration is tied directly to the game's progression, earning XP and tech parts to unlock new skills and equipment. You always felt like you were progressing. There was always something on the end in terms of reward for exploration. Never did I feel like I had to do certain tasks to improve my abilities or gadgets, but I wanted to do them. The reason I say this is because Hogwarts Legacy is fresh in my mind. In that game, you'd fill up your inventory so quick and have to do tedious tasks like Merlin trials to expand your inventory, but I just didn't want to do it, even though I loved that game. But in Spider-Man 2, I never really ran into anything like that. Everything flowed nicely in terms of progression because this game's progression and exploration work so well together. A piece of side content that I got through exploring springs to mind here, and that is the Howard side mission. If you've played through it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It was one of my favorite moments from the game. This was a small little hidden gem that the game offered, and it was a nice change of pace from the chaos of the main story, and it was really sad. So it's fair to say I thoroughly enjoyed the way this game handled its exploration overall. And although by no means an industry leader in terms of standards, it was exactly what a Spider-Man game needed. So to bring this one all together, after all the hype has subsided for Marvel's Spider-Man 2, it is absolutely one of the best games of the year, without question worthy of its game of the year contender status. A game that takes what works from the first game and builds on it, to create something truly special, exactly what a sequel should do. It has some tiny bumps along the way, but this game truly stands as one of the best Spider-Man stories ever told, much like the first game. An excellent story filled with emotion and heart, gameplay that will keep you coming back for hours on end, and exploration for an excellent open world that is totally worth exploring every inch as a Spider-Man fan. Marvel's Spider-Man 2 absolutely lived up to the hype, albeit it's not perfect, but it's really, really damn close to it.